Um, this is another in our Bible study series, The Greatest, and we're looking at the greatest fall this week. Um, if you should read 1 Kings chapter 10 and 1 Kings chapter 11 verses 1 to 9 uh, before listening to this. There is a link uh, below this video. And as we think about the greatest fall, well, 1% of falls start with a person stood on one leg, standing on a tin of beans, attempting to juggle 10 balls. That's how 1% of falls start, whereas 99% of falls start with somebody stood, stood on two feet. Most falls start with a person stood on two feet, looking stable, as if they were never going to fall. It's worth mentioning this because, as a nurse, there's a sentence that I've heard more than any other, and it's the statement, Don't worry, I won't fall. Every person who has fallen thought exactly the same. We could say the same about Solomon, who is the example of probably the greatest fall in the Bible. There were so many reasons that Solomon looked stable, as if he should never have been fallen. Firstly, he was David's son. Solomon had the warning of David's words and the example of David's life. We read in the book of Kings that David said to his son, Observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and regulations, as written in the law of Moses. David had done what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not failed to keep any of the Lord's commands all the days of his life, life except in the case of Uriah. The Hittite. Solomon, Solomon was David's son and he was also the king and kings were to write by hand their own copy of the law. Every single king would get a pen and paper and write the entire entirety of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Jerusalem, uh, Deuteronomy by hand. They would know God's, what, what God's word said better than anybody else. And not only that, but Solomon was wise. Solomon's head was filled with wisdom, and it was part of his daily business to teach the, this wisdom to other people. We read, in, we read in chapter 10 that the whole world sought audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom that God had put in his heart. And Solomon, well, Solomon enjoyed a high degree of fellowship with God. God confronted Solomon about his sin eye to eye. We read in the book, we read in the book, chapter 10 that the God of Israel appeared to Solomon twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's commands. God appeared to Solomon, confronted him about his sin eye to eye, and yet Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. We read in the book of Jer Jer in Nehemiah, among the many nations there was no king like him. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by foreign women. women. Don't worry, I won't fall is a sentence that should never come out of our mouths. Now, one was right response to these kind of stories about great falls in the Bible. It's a great reminder that all people are sinners. We all need Jesus and his mercy and forgiveness to pick us up when we fall. That's one right interpretation of the passage. But it's also equally right to use these stories as a warning against presumption. It's good to use these to remind us, to point, point out to us that no sin is beyond us. In the book of Corinthians, Paul writes, These things happen to them as examples, and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the accumulation of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. You know, if we presume that the same will never happen to us, these things might just sneak upon us. Whereas if we presume that the same could happen to us, that we could fall, 
then we're in a much better place to avoid making the same mistakes. So what contributed to Solomon's fall? What principles did he ignore? Well, here are a few thoughts. Well, Solomon applied God's word to others, but not to himself. We read in chapter 10 that the whole world sought audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom that God had put in his heart. You know, with great zeal, Solomon passed on the wisdom that God had given him. But he was less interested in applying this wisdom to himself. Though he made it his business to teach and direct and correct others, the word of God rarely informed his own actions. And this is a danger for, le for church leaders and for, in fact, for all of God's people. As we read in the book of James, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. You know, there's something deceiving, there's something self-blinding about listening to God's word or even talking about God's word. It makes us feel holy. It makes us feel religiously superior. It gives us false reassurance. If we just listen to it, we deceive ourselves that we are doing the right thing. Yeah, we deceive ourselves. Also Solomon, he fought back feebly. We read in chapter 10, verse 13, King Solomon gave the Queen of Sheba all she desired and asked for beside what he had given out of his royal bounty. So Solomon, he decided that he would give the Queen of Sheba a set amount of his riches. You know, he was more than aware of the persuasive power of a woman in a slinky dress. He was aware that he might want to give her more. And so he said, no, I'm going to give her this much and no further. And yet, King Solomon gave the Queen of Sheba all she desired and asked for, besides what he had given her out of his royal bounty. You know, he'd made a rule for himself. I'm only going to give this woman so much of myself and my resources. But he quickly broke that rule. He, made an, he decided to apply self-control and then forgot to apply it later. And he cut this comp these cut these types of compromises gradually occurred more and more and more. You know, as we read, you know, so Solomon began with a single foreign wife. And that single foreign wife soon became several foreign wives. And Solomon's first compromise began a trend of increasing compromises, which only got bigger and bigger and bigger. We see this progressive, stage-by-stage stage, descent into compromise and idolatry in verses 4 to 8. We read in verse 5 that Solomon followed Ashtoreth, the, god the, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Moloch, the detestable god of the Amorites. So Dot Solomon gave in to two out of five of his wives. Some of them worshipped the, 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 the god Ash, Asherah, some of them worshipped Moloch, and he gave in to two out of his five wives' demands that he should worship them as well. But three out of, five of his five wives, well, he said, no, I'm not going to worship your gods. Then in verse 7 we read, On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Mode, and for Moloch, the detestable god of the Ammonites. Two out of five soon became four out of five. And four out of five suddenly became five out of five in verse, eight, verse five. Eight, sorry. Solomon did the same for all his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. What began as a, sole, a single compromise became total compromise, gradually, slowly one by one. And though God warned him about these things, these warnings were not heeded. Chapter 11 verse 9, the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him 
twice. God spoke to Solomon, but he ignored what God had said. And so we read in verse chapter 3, verse 3, that Solomon loved the Lord. And then chapter 11, verse 1, King Solomon, however, loved very many foreign white women. Solomon's love for the Lord, and he loved the Lord, and yet he was pulled in another direction by his many foreign wives. He loved them, and, they, and because he loved them, he wanted to join them in that idolatry. And eventually, Solomon's love for the Lord got less and less and less and less. He thought he could both love the Lord and his foreign wives at the same time, but he failed. As we read in the book of Matthew, Jesus said, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. Solomon was corrupted by the thing that he loved. He loved it to an unhealthy degree, so his love for the Lord got less and less and less. Just going to read some other verses from the New Testament, which describe how a love for something might lead to compromise or the abandoning of our faith. In the book of John. Yet, at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in Jesus. But, because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith, for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. These people's love for the human praise made them compromise with their love and their faith for God. In the book of James, Timothy, and in the book of Mark, we read these three verses. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And Timothy, Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. The book of Mark. Others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. We see that these people's love for God was eroded because they loved the world, wealth, the desire for other things, the things that this world has to offer, caused them to compromise in their faith in Jesus Christ and God. Again, in the book of John, chapter 3, John. John writes, I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Diotrephes. He loved to put himself first, to be the centre of his attention, to have his own way. And in his life within the churches of that day, it caused him to compromise in his faith in God, because he loved himself more. So Solomon fell. But there's something quite surprising about Solomon, is that though he fell, he also wrote the books of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, which are full of warning after warning of the dangers of making the same mistakes. Much of the early parts of Proverbs is warnings about making mistakes like this. Solomon says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. He says, She, wisdom, is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. Proverbs is full of warning after warning about the dangers of idolatry, compromise, and giving in to the, giving in to sinful desires. And much of Ecclesiastes is the same. 
Solomon learnt what works and what doesn't work from his mistakes. So that when he taught people that we don't have to make the same ones that he made. In Ecclesiastes 2, Solomon writes, For what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. If you get a chance, read the book of Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes with Solomon as the author in mind. He's, full, he's warning people to not make the same mistakes that he did. And it's something surprising again again, about Solomon is that he then wrote Song of Solomon. Why did Solomon, the most (laughs) poly... Why did Solomon, the person who had multiple foreign wives, who lived, was potentially very adulterous, lived very adulterously, why did Solomon write the book The Song of Solomon, which is a book about a couple being consumed with love for each other and nobody else. How could Solomon, the man with multiple wives, the adulterous Solomon, write a book like this? Well, I think chapter 5 of Proverbs gives us a clue. It says, Rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe, Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? Solomon recognised that the best protection from loving the wrong things is the love of the right thing. A happy marriage is the best prevention against adultery. In much the same way, if we think of these other things that we might love, well, the best remedy for them is to a greater love for something else. If you start find yourself loving the praise of people, if you find yourself needing to win their approval, then start loving the fact that God loves you, that God's love for you doesn't need to be won. If you find yourself loving to be in control, needing to be in control all the time, Start loving the fact that God is a sovereign God, that he remains in control where things are in a mess. If you find yourself loving the things of this world, start loving the fact that the joys of heaven are even greater. All earthly joy is just a very, very diluted version of the joys to come. So don't trade in the one for the other. If we always return to our first love, loving God the first and the best, then it'll prevent us being led astray by other loves that might lead us astray. As it says in the book of Revelation, Yet I hold this against you, you have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. The best... the the best protection from going astray, from loving other things to a sinful degree, is to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind.